Hey all, back with another video. This lesson is on the rights of a holder in due course. So if you remember in the previous lesson, we were looking at what is a holder in due course and how does one acquire the status of a holder in due course. And now we're gonna look at what are the rights of a holder in due course, meaning what, what immunities do they have and what powers do they have. So let's jump right in to find out how that works. So first we're gonna look at what the immunity to certain defenses. And so our first point is that a holder in due course is subject only to a small set of defenses or a subset of defenses known as real defenses. And so remember if we're looking at an example of how this issue even comes up, it would be something like this. You've got Bob. Bob is going to the shop in a business capacity to purchase supplies on credit. And of course, the shop is going to deliver those supplies to him. And because he's buying on credit, it might not be uncommon for him to have to sign a promissory note indicating his promise to pay. And he would give that note, issue that note to the shop. And then we have over and over again talked about how a shop may negotiate that note to something like a bank or in this case, a finance company. And so they're going to promise to deliver the note in exchange for value. In this case, both a promise and then remember, we need a performance of that promise in order for it to count as value for purposes of Article 3. So we've got that here that the promise is paid. The note goes to the finance company. The money for that note goes to the shop. And then we've hypothesized over and over again and then of a situation where what if then the shop in this case breaches the contract with Bob? What does that mean about whether or not Bob has to pay that note? Does he have to pay off the note when it comes due or not, even though the shop breached the underlying contract? And what we said last lesson is we need to know whether or not the finance company there is a holder in due course or not, because that's going to determine what defenses they are subject to or not subject to. So if they are mere, a mere holder, meaning not a, a holder in due course, then any defense that Bob has can be raised, including the fact that the shop breached and didn't deliver the supplies. He could raise that as a defense. If they're a holder in due course, then remember what that would mean. They're only subject to what are called real defenses. So that means the finance company is going to prevail over pretty much a, a whole host of defenses, right? The vast majority of them, um, what are known as personal defenses. So only certain real defenses, which we'll enumerate here in a second, are going to work uh, for Bob to be able to assert if in fact the finance company is a holder in due course. So we've got to remember, well, what are our requirements for a holder in due course? Remember, they've won, they've got to be a holder, meaning, meaning that they must both possess the instrument in question and it must be payable to them, whether, that, whether it's a note or it's a check, it must be endorsed such that it's payable to them, to whoever's possessing it, in this case, to the finance company. So for them to be any kind of holder at all, they've got to both possess the instrument and for it to be payable, subject to some exceptions dealing with things like depository banks, things like that, where we've seen, well, if I go and deposit a check at my at my bank and forget to endorse it over to them. There are rules that say they can still be a holder. 
So remember too, whoop, I didn't do that correctly there. I skipped it. it looks like I skipped doing it. But remember, they have to to ha to pay value for that instrument. And we said that val we looked at a number of different ways in which value can be given. Just remember, it's not analogous to consideration. There are uh, there's obviously some overlap, but there are plenty of instances where we would say there's not cons that there. Uh, there might be consideration, but there's not value for purposes of Article 3. Then we said that they must acquire the instrument without any notice. And we said notice of any defense or claim uh, or of any sort of unusual set of facts that would give question, raise questions about the validity of the instrument or its propriety. So they have to have no notice. And uh, so I just got those out of order. I apologize for their, for that. And they have to take it in good faith, meaning that if they know, for instance, and we used this example in the last lesson, that if they know that the that the shop here, for instance, has a reputation for being uh, scammy or uh, of being of cheating people, uh, of not being above board, then that suggests that they have facts, that even though they may not have notice of a particular defense or a particular claim, or even particular facts about that particular note that says that it it's you know overdue or something along those lines, or that it's been altered or forged, but. What they do have is knowledge about the business that gives uh, rise to the idea of, well, this may not be above board, so that suggests they're not taking in good faith. So here, if we went through these, remember, they've all got to be satisfied for, for the shop here. If they are, then they'll qualify as a holder in due course. And so if we assume here that they're a holder in due course, that means the only defenses to which they will be subject are these quote unquote real defenses. So what are these real defenses? Well, uh, Section 3305A2 lays the, these defenses out for us. And so we're going to look that there's minority or what's sometimes called infancy at common law is referred to as infancy. So the defense of minority or infancy duress, the defense of duress, the defense of a lack of legal capacity and illegality and fraud in the factum or in the making and bankruptcy, bankruptcy, that something's been discharged in bankruptcy. So let's look at each of these in a little more detail, starting with minority. So remember with minority how it works. I'm not going to get into all the details of what we went over in contracts during your first year, but do remember that when you're thinking about minority, the general rule is that a, a contract made by a minor is voidable at the option of the minor any time before reaching the age of majority and for a reasonable time after that. So that's the general rule. Yes, there are nuances and exceptions like necessities or if they misrepresent their age or there might be some limitations if they engage in tortious conduct, those kinds of things. But the general rule is the general rule we learn from contracts. And it's one of the real defenses that can be asserted is if the person made the contract with the negotiable instrument when they were a minor. And so if we were to look at back at this fact circumstance with Bob, having bought these supplies on credit from the shop and then the shop negotiating that note to the finance company, and then we left off with well, our question is whether or not Bob is going to have to pay this note when it comes due. Does he have to pay it when, when the shop has breached? He would have a defense on the underlying contract. Can he raise breach? And we, that, we'll see that breach of contract, and we went through our six defenses there, and it was not one of the real defenses. So no, but what if 
we say that yes, he's a holder in due course, and that or that the finance company is a holder in due course. But what if in this case we want to we want to check a couple things, right? That which is okay it, when we're looking at this fact pattern. We already said one. Can Bob, if, if the finance company is a holder in due course, can Bob raise the defense of the a breach of contract by the shop, by the other party? No, that's not one of the real defenses he can bring to say that he should be excused from having to pay the note. So no, the other thing, remember, is that if he were buying these supplies on credit for himself, for a consumer transaction, if it was a consumer credit sale, then he would be able to raise any defenses that he had, right? We said that under federal law, that if it's a consumer credit sale, the consumer retains all their defenses, even against a holder in due course, right? A holder in due course can't use that status as against somebody who is who entered into the transaction in this consumer credit sale as, as a consumer. Here, we have to assume, if that were true, if this were a consumer credit sale, then Bob would be fine. He could raise his defenses. But let's assume it's not, that it's for business reasons. Then, um, so we dealt with both of these things, right? We dealt with not a consumer credit sale, not breach is not going to work because it's not a real defense. And but let's assume he's got a yo-yo there and now that he's a minor, right? Because a yo-yo, of course, is some sort of universal sign for being a minor. But let's assume that it's an unusual transaction because obviously a not very many minors are engaging in uh, transactions for business purposes, for commercial purposes. Uh, usually they would be some sort of consumer transaction. But let's assume in this case that that's what's going on, that Bob is a minor. And if that's the case, then he would be able to, to, to assert minority as a real defense, right? He could assert it as a defense against paying the note. So when the note comes due and finance company presents it for payment, makes the demand for payment, Bob can say, well, I was a minor when I entered into the transaction which generated this note and therefore I have a defense. So he would be able to use it even if finance company is holder in due course because it's, it's a real defense. And duress, same thing, it's a real defense. What do we mean by duress? Remember that it's if the parties, if Bob can say my manifestation of, of a sin was induced by an improper threat by the other party that left me no reasonable alternative, then the contract is voidable by the victim of that duress. So this is just the contract, the definition of duress we learned about in contracts. And this is, you can break it up into elements. It's the same exact defense. And it works as a real defense, even against a holder in due course. So here, again, if we're assuming the finance company is a holder in due course, we've checked that off there. Then if Bob can show, hey, I assented to this. I only agreed to sign this note because of duress from the shop owner or somebody else was some other party was pressuring him into the that transaction through an improper threat he would have a real defense to that there's a caution we need to have which is this the fact that somebody urgently needs to borrow money or they need to borrow or enter in you know into a credit transaction in order for them to do business that is not duress right we're not going to allow the duress rule to swallow all the other rules because obviously people often engage you know get a loan or engage in a tr credit transaction some you know a lot of times because they want to but sometimes because they don't right they have a need to borrow uh because they haven't re really do have no choice but that doesn't make it duress you want to make sure there's an improper threat there and even that's not even that is not even um what we would call a 
uh, economic duress, the mere fact it, that some I, the the individual party Bob has a financial need to get credit or to get a loan does not make it economic duress. It remember it would have to be somebody trying to it, it, they are in, they are threatening a breach of the implied obligation of good faith and fair dealing. They they are in some way threatening something like a breach if the person doesn't agree. Uh, those kinds of situations, not this. So you just want to be careful that you don't turn every situation where it's like, ah, I can only get credit on not so great terms or I, ha I can only get a loan on, you know, with a high interest rate or whatever it may be. That doesn't make it duress. The fact that some a party needs the financing and can only do so on not so great terms doesn't make it duress. The other thing to keep in mind is, let's say the terms were particularly onerous or bad before we jump to the next defense. Let me say this. So but let's say that the, the terms were not only not great, but let's say me, they might qualify as unconscionable. Realize that unconscionability is not a real defense. Duress is, but not unconscionability. Unconscionability would it work as a defense for the underlying contract? Sure, right? We talked about that last class, but it wouldn't work, or not last class, but in, in your first year contracts class. So, it, but it wouldn't work, remember, as a real defense to a holder in due course who's holding the note. So let's look at lack of legal capacity. I know in our first year contract class, we talked about minority and minority under the under a lack of capacity, and it, it you could lump it under there. What you'll see though is Article Three breaks it out a bit from the other types of of lack of capacity that we're referring to here under three. So what we mean here is going to depend on whether or not we're referring to a person or a corporation. So with a person, when we say lack of legal capacity here, we mean a lack of mental capacity, that the person is is mentally incompetent, right? Remember that we would generally say something like, well, is it the case that because of a mental illness or disability, that the person is unable to understand the transaction in, and relate to that transaction in a re or so, in, in a reasonable way, or are they able to understand the nature and the consequences of the transaction in a reasonable way? And if the answer is no, then they would lack mental capacity due to their mental disability or mental illness. When we're talking about a corporation. The general argument here is something like the corporation didn't exist yet, right? So it didn't have the capacity to enter into a transaction or to execute a note or to make out a check because it didn't yet exist. Maybe it exists now, but at the time this transaction was entered into, it didn't. So if we're looking at this, if we were to look and say, okay, let's assume this is about Bob the person such as it, such as he is um, if we're looking at that and saying okay because of a mental illness or disability he's unable to understand the nature and consequences of the transaction in a reasonable way then he would be able to assert that defense of mental incompetence and that would serve as a real defense as against holder in due course who's holding the note here now, if we're talking on the corporate side, let's assume that Bob gets into the shipping business here. He has a shipping company here at, at, the, uh, at the harbor. And that then, it, so when he entered into the transaction, it was just Bob, right? He executed the note, everything went the way it did. And now, when the note, by the time the note comes due, He's not doing business as an individual. He's doing business as this corporation that's doing this shipping. And there, if they go, if the finance company tries to insist that the corporation 
pay for the node, right, demand that they, they can say, no, we lack legal, the corporation lacked legal capacity. It didn't exist. It could not have executed the note at that point in time, even if those supplies and things ultimately relate to what became this business at the time, the corporate entity that exists as the shipping company now didn't exist then. So you can't go after the, the shipping company, the corporation there, and demand that it pay since it didn't exist. So that brings us to number four, which is illegality. Illegality, again, it's one of you you probably remember from contracts, right? Illegality, violation of public policy, that one of the things that's key to, to know here, the nuance here under Article 3, is that if it's illegality that just makes the, the transaction voidable, that it's voidable, then that doesn't work for as a real defense under Article 3. That if it's illegality that merely makes the contract voidable, meaning that it's not void from the beginning, it's not void ab initio, it's it's that it's void it is voidable at the option of the party, right? It's voidable at the op it's an optional thing, then that would not be a real defense. However, if it's void ab initio or void from the outset, then if it's that kind of illegality, that is a real defense. So what do these things mean, right? So this is the one we need to be concerned about. This is the real defense, not that one. So when we look at this, what is voidable? It, it, here's a, a, a possibility of something that would merely that will be illegal, but merely voidable, which is that if a check is paid, right, as part of a contract violating a licensing law. So your check is used to pay as part of a contract that's violating li a licensing law. So for instance, like uh, to pay for uh, legal services by an unlicensed attorney or to pay a plumber who is not licensed to those kinds of things. That is typically merely voidable at the option of the party. Of, of the party. Uh, so if I'm the one purchasing the legal services, it would be voidable at my option. It's the other party who engaged in the illegality, that, assuming I had no knowledge of it. But um, it's voidable, and so that doesn't work as a real defense to this check. And, but if it's void from the outset, void ab initio, well, what would that be? A typical example that's often used under Article 3 is somebody who executes a note or a check in a state where it's illegal to gamble. So if you're engaging in some sort of illegal gambling and you're executing a note that is evidence of that debt, that gambling debt, or if you're using a check to pay off some sort of gambling, illegal gambling obligation, that would be void from the outset. It would be void of an issue. Same thing would be true with some sort of obligation to pay for illegal drugs, something like that, if you had to sign some sort of note as uh, to evidence an obligation to pay for illegal narcotics, something like that that same thing, it would be void from the outset. So if we look at this, so here, and I even said that, if if the shop here sold Bob's supplies, say for the illegal drug trade, then illegality could be used, right? If they're selling him something that's illegal, it's an illegal transaction, then illegality could be raised if that's what it's about, right? If the note is about an obligation for some sort of illegal supplies, then uh, much like a gambling debt, it would be void from the outset or void ab initio, and therefore it could be used. Um, that is a real defense, and it could be asserted against the finance company when it comes time to pay on the note. So, yeah, if so, this is the other possibility. Remember, if if the facts were simply that the shop needed a license to sell whatever it's selling, then that would just make it voidable, and it would not be a real defense. You would not be able to use it as a real defense. 
So what about fraud in the factum or in the making? So if you remember in our first year contracts class, we used the word misrepresentation, um, but we were kind of encompassing more or less both what's called fraud in the factum and fraud in the inducement. Um, fraud, fraud in the factum is sometimes in, talked about as fraud in the making. Um, so here, um, this is what section 3305A23 says. It says, fraud that induced the obligor, so Bob the obligor, right? The one's going to obligate it on the note, to sign the instrument with neither knowledge nor reasonable opportunity to learn of its character, its essential terms. So there's only one type of fraud. It's called fraud in the factum or fraud in the making. So, and it's important to understand there are two parts to it, right? That you neither knew what that you were signing an instrument, right? I, that the I as the obligor didn't know I was signing a note, or I didn't know I was I was signing a check. And but that alone, a lack of knowledge by itself is not enough. It also has to be the case. It says, nor can it be that the party had a reasonable opportunity to learn of the instrument's character or its essential terms. So I've got to be able to show both that I didn't know what it is I was signing and that I didn't have an opportunity, a reasonable opportunity to learn what it is that I was signing. So if we go start here with him uh, getting uh, Bob approaching the shop, he's going to buy supplies on credit. They're going to deliver the supplies. And the shop says, we just need you to sign some paperwork and then we're good. And Bob is thinking, oh, I left my glasses in the car. And so he just signs it, right? No, well, I signed it. Here you go. So he just signed the note and gave it to them, even though he didn't read it, right? He didn't read it because he didn't want to go to the car to get his glasses. In that case, right, when this gets, if we fast forward, right, from here all the way to the note gets negotiated to finance company, and then it comes due, and Bob says, I didn't even know it was a promissory note I signed. So he lacks knowledge, but here he had a reasonable opportunity. He just chose not to go to the car to get his glasses to read it. So he would not be able to assert fraud in the factum, right? He would not be able to assert well, it's not it's not going to satisfy fraud in the factum or fraud in the making because he can't meet the reasonable no reasonable opportunity element. If he could, then it would be a defense. But realize it's going to be a rare case where where it's a situation where the obligor or if it's a note, we can say the maker, the maker of that note neither knows what it is they're signing, nor had a reasonable opportunity to find out. You need to have both of those things, and that's just going to be exceptionally rare case where that occurs. So then bankruptcy discharge, what we mean here is that if the obligor, if the maker of the note, or uh, say the drawer of a check, and we'll talk, we're going to talk more about liability on the instrument because it may be unclear to you, like, well, how would it ever get back to the drawer? Isn't the draw a bank the one that's got to pay? And that's true, but we'll talk about um, the different ways that a party may be liable on an instrument, um, including like endorsers liability and the, the, how liability could go back to the drawer, those kinds of things, and in what circumstances. So we'll talk all about that. But in a situation where the party has gone through bankruptcy, right? So if we talk about a note, which is what we're going to focus on. If a party signs a note and that the debt, right? That debt that's evidenced by that note is discharged through the process of bankruptcy, then that is, that's it, right? They don't have to pay. Even if the party holding it is a holder in due course, they're out of luck. That is, that works as it were as a sort of real defense against them having to pay because they went through bankruptcy, the debt's been discharged. The fact that they're a holder in due course, that's great, but that doesn't mean they can force that debtor to pay 
even though they've they've gone through bankruptcy. So at, at a simple level, it, it, it realized that bankruptcy laws, federal, this all, Article Three is going to be state law. Federal law is going to override or preempt anything that Article Three said says because it's state law, right? So. Um, but the other part of that to keep in mind, right? It's true that a lot of bankruptcy is federal, and that um, and that Article Three, any you know, states that have adopted Article Three, it's obviously going to be state law, and so the bankruptcy law is going to override it. That being said, there there are state law bankruptcy proceedings in many jurisdictions, even in those cases. The, the way that Article 3 is written, that too would be a defense, right? So just period, whether or not there's there's preemption going on there or not, it would still work as a defense based on the way Article 3 is written. So if that if we look at this and, it, you know, Bob's going bankrupt here, he's losing lost all his money, then he's declared bankrupt by the court. It's discharge and bankruptcy. That's going to be a defense, right? The finance company cannot go after him just because it's a holder in due course. So that works as a defense. Now, there are other rights outside of these real defenses and these immune, um, and this general immunity that a holder in due course enjoys, but except for these real defenses, there are other things that, that go along with the status of being a holder in due course. And... The first of these is they're not subject to claims, right? A, a holder in due course is subject to no claims at all. There's not even a small subset. So unlike defenses, there are no claims to which a holder in due course is subject. But it's important to say, well, what is a claim? Here's what Section 3306 says. It says a person having rights of a holder in due course takes free of any claim to the instrument. Okay, it doesn't answer what is a claim. Here's what we mean. If we go through here and remember this basic setup of the, except instead of a note now, we have Bob writing a check to pay for supplies. He's not buying them on credit then. He's just using a check, gives it to the shop. And Let's assume that Bo sneaks in here and steals the check. Okay, so Bo stole the check from the shop and he goes to uh, the the check casher here, uh, check cash corner, whatever you want to call it, to the little shop on the corner to, to have the check bought. And so he stole it, remember, and then he gives it to them in order to get money. So if we assume that they're a holder in due course, right, that they have, that they took it in good faith, that they took it for value, and they had no notice of the of Bo's theft, all those things, that they qualify as a holder in due course, right? And also, obviously, they'd have to be a holder because they obviously they possess it, but it would have to be endorsed. So we would have to assume that it was endorsed before Bo stole it so that he didn't forge the endorsement. Um, but here, if, if that was all true, then uh, they would be a holder in due course of this check. So the, the question we're, we're looking at, though, is what is a claim? This is what we mean by a claim, is that the person is saying, in, in this case with the check, saying, that's my check. I own the check and the proceeds of that check. They're claiming the check. That's what we mean here by claim. They're claiming the check. Right. And it's absolutely the case that they did have the check and it was stolen and they were entitled to the proceeds. So that's not wrong. They have a claim to it. But if they're a holder in due course, if the little corner shop, little check cash corner is a holder in due course, then they take free of that claim. Right, if they indeed are a holder in due course, they take free of that claim entirely. And we need to be really careful here because there are things that might look like 
they are defenses right, that, that you're tempted to go, oh, that's a real defense. So the debtor can raise that. The maker of the note can raise that against the holder in due course. And, but in fact, what's going on is this is a claim. And if it's a claim, they, the holder in due course, is it, there are no claims to which they are subject. So we need to distinguish that. So here's how you want to think of a defense in this context. It's saying, I have a defense that excuses me from having to pay. When the note comes due, right, when the check is being paid, the, the person is raising the defense. In this case, saying, this is, I am, this note I I have a defense to have I don't have to pay it, right? My the defense is being raised as to the obligation to pay. If that's the case, then a holder in due course is subject to any defense that falls under our category of real defenses. And we said a mere holder is subject to all the defenses, all the contract defenses and other arguments like lack of consideration and things you could make. All those would apply to somebody who's merely a holder. Whereas a claim, somebody going, that check is rightfully mine, give it back right? That's how you want to think of a claim. They're saying, that's mine. The check is mine. Then give it back. Give it back. That's a claim, right? Or the note stolen. Hey, that was my note. Give it back. That's a claim. Those are claims where the person is saying, give it back. Or I'm trying to rescind the transaction and telling you, give me back the, the check that I gave you or give me back that, right? So if, um, think of it as, let's say Bob pays with the check, that for his supplies, the check, you could even have it just negotiated to a holder in due course, rather than both stealing it. And then Bob, if Bob tries to rescind it based on some sort of defense he may have, and he's trying to get the check back from the holder in due course, that would be a claim. He's not saying this is defense to me having to pay. He's saying I have a claim to that. That is mine. If that's the case, a mere holder, again, subject to all, right? They'd be subject to all claims, but a holder in due course is the exact opposite. They're subject to no claims, zero at all. So we always need to know, are we thinking about defenses? Are we thinking about claims? So if we look at an example again, if we assume from the beginning here that Bob is a miner and that he buys supplies here from and gets them delivered. And again, remember, we have to assume it's a business transaction. Otherwise, if it's a consumer credit sale, then that in and of itself would put it out. It wouldn't matter. You could raise any defense you want even if the party's a holder in due course. So you'd have to assume it's a business transaction, however unlikely that is. So he pays with the check, again, unlikely for a minor, but assume that's the case, they deliver the check, pay the money. Um, and so if we assume that the check is negotiated to the finance company, the finance company becomes a holder in due course, and then a defense is raised, right? A defense would be Bob saying, I'm not liable on that check because I was a minor when I signed it, right? He's saying, when I, I, when I entered into this transaction, I was a minor. When I signed that check and everything, I was a minor. So that, that would be a real defense that you could assert against finance company, even if they're a holder in due course. But if it's a claim that he's asserting, right? If he's saying, give me that check back. I was a minor when I signed it, right? Rescind this, give it back to me. It's my check. I want it back. That's a different argument. He's making a claim on the check. He's not asserting it as a defense to whatever obligation there may be. He's saying, I am, I want it back, give me it back. That is a claim on the check. 
that is not going to work. He cannot get the check back because the finance company as a holder in due course takes free of all claims. So you just want to distinguish those in your mind because even though that it may be like, oh, that person's a minor or it looks like it's a real defense, but what they're actually doing is making a claim. And that's different. That doesn't fall under real defense. So the other thing we said, what are these other rights? The first thing we talked about is that they take free of any claim, a holder in due course. But the, the something we need to note here is that a holder in due course is subject to discharge by payment of the instrument. Discharge by payment of the instrument. And this is something we'll get into more moving forward, but it's important to note and 3302B tells us that if a holder in due course takes an instrument with notice of payment, it may only collect the unpaid amount. So quick example here, we'll look at two examples, but consider example one here, which is this, that the shop is gonna negotiate this, um, this note that it has to a holder in due course, and they alert the holder in due course, they say, Hey, 7,000 of this $10,000 note's already been paid. And then they give it to the holder in due course. So they have noticed that what? 7,000 of the 10,000 has already been paid. So they're only going to be able to demand 3,000. The only thing they can collect as a holder in due course is 3,000. So that they're not free of... They can't look at the face of it and be like, well, on the face of it, it says 10,000. If they have noticed that 7,000 of it has been paid off, then they are subject to the discharge there by that's occurred due to payment. So that is pretty straightforward and probably makes sense. Where it gets a little more complicated is with example two, which is in this case, we again assume finance company is a holder in due course down here. And let's assume here that they, they're holding the note, right? They're a holder in due course. Finance company's got the note. But remember, the note was initially issued to the shop, right? It was to finance a purchaser. So the payee, the original payee of the note, the payee was the shop. And so let's assume that Bob, while they're holding the note, Bob pays the shop, makes payment to the shop. He pays off the outstanding amounts due on the note to the shop. What effect that does, does that have? Because they don't hold the note anymore. The finance company holds it. Here's what Article 3 says in 3602B which is where payment is made to a former person entitled to enforce the instrument. And we'll come back to, we're going to use this phrase a lot in the next lesson, which is, a, this, the, this is often abbreviated as a PEAT, a person entitled to enforce. A person entitled to enforce. So we're, so remember, the shop would have been, a is a former person, person or party entitled to enforce the instrument. They they used to be able to demand it, right? They were holding it and they were the, they were the payee of it and they could have demanded payment, eventually presented it when it came due to Bob and demanded that he pay. But in this case, if they make if the party makes payment to a former Pete that discharge of that payment, that, that what's called a discharge by payment, it is effective against the real P, the finance company, even if though they're a holder in due course, the only ex exception is unless they gave notice to the obligor, to the maker of the note, to Bob. If they gave notice that, hey, I'm holding the note now, make payment to me, then Bob would not be able to make payment to the shop, right? Because he knows where he's supposed to make fun, make payment and he was dumb and didn't do it. He didn't follow the notice. 
So there, that payment isn't going to work, right? That payment to the former holder of the note would not work if he knows that's not where he's supposed to pay. So it's supposed to be the rule. It makes sense if you stop to think about it is it's supposed to incentivize somebody who is now holding the instrument to notify the relevant parties. It, because if they don't, then they could pay a former party and that would di that discharge of any obligation that they're you know paying a down a note, something like that would be effective against them. So if that's what's going on here, that would be effective, right? If they failed to give notice to Bob when they bought the note, then Bob's payment to the shop counts against the finance company. So this, this is what we covered last lesson. I just want to hit it again. Remember this, that a holder in due course is subject to a consumer's defenses in a credit sale transaction. So if it's a consumer credit sale, then the fact that there's a note that's being held by a holder in due course doesn't matter because the consumer can raise any defenses they have. So remember, we said it doesn't apply to consumer credit sales. So we saw Bo, if he executes a note in order to buy goods or to buy services as a consumer, sent, then we said, any note that they execute or finance agreement has to say this, any holder of this consumer credit contract, say finance company, is subject to all claims and defenses which the debtor could assert against the seller of goods and services obtained with the proceeds hereof. Recovery hereunder by the debtor shall not exceed amounts paid by the debtor hereunder. So, the, it, but the, you need to remember when we say consumer credit sale, it's narrow. It's important to remember that consumer a, a, that a consumer and a consumer credit sale can raise any defenses they have against a, ho a holder in due course. But there are a whole lot of situations in which the holder in due course doctrine still applies. Remember that if the consumer is issuing a check, which is pretty darn common, right, for consumer transactions. If they're executing a note as part of a mortgage, home mortgage, that's pretty common. Again, that holder in due course doctrine still apply. Then if it's just a straight up loan for money, not part of financing the purchase of a good or service, then straight up loan for money, that note, again, still the holder in due course doctrine would apply. You could only raise real defenses. So that's it. Uh, I, I hope you're doing well. Hope you're hanging in there. More will be on the way, and uh, I'll be in touch. Talk to you soon. Thanks. Bye.